Welcome to Beyond Protocols. My name is McKay Rippey, and before you forget, I want you to visit us at mycotoxinmasterclass.com. That's mycotoxinmasterclass.com. If you're interested in helping your mold patients and clients get better, faster, and with fewer adverse reactions, this is for you. So go check it out, mycotoxinmasterclass.com. So a lot of us have clients who are dealing with iron behaving badly. It's, we need it, but it's not doing the things that we want it to be doing in the body. And there are a multitude of reasons why, and there are a lot of challenges in accurately measuring iron in different areas of the body. So I'm gonna do something I don't often do which is read a lot of stuff from my notes because <laughs> I took about, I don't know, four hours <laughs> to put this together and I wanna make sure that, that I don't miss anything. First, where are we getting iron? So we're getting it from two places. We're getting it from the recycling of heme and we are getting it from our food. And most of the iron in our food is gonna be Fe3+. plus. So this is our ferric, iron or our oxidized iron. Um, so Fe3 plus or our ferric iron travels through the stomach to the small intestines. And it's within the lumen of the small intestine that we absorb iron. However, our food-based iron is Fe3 and the enterocytes of the lumen can't absorb ferric iron. They absorb ferrous iron Fe2 plus. So that's the first issue where we may be dealing with some malabsorption of dietary iron along the apical surface of the enterocytes or that kind of top surface. There's an enzyme called vitamin C ferroreductase. So this is where vitamin C is so critical for our absorption of iron. So this is what converts um, our Fe3 to Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. So we need C in, in order, and we need a functional <laughs> vitamin C ferroreductase in order for this conversion to happen or the iron doesn't get in in the first place. So that's number one. So also along that apical surface of the enterocytes, it are the divalent metal transporter one. And so this is going to be a really relevant piece in uh, Tina's case. These are encoded by solute carriers that you'll find in the iron absorption section. And we'll take a look at those when we look at her case study. But there are variants along the DMT1, which significantly impair that absorption of intestinal iron. So we have two places where iron just might not be getting in. Um, so the, that divalent metal transporter is actually a co-transporter. It's gonna take in our ferrous iron and hydrogen. So that's gonna be really key as well. And another tool that we can use to help mobilize the iron, support the DMT1 and, and normalize some of these levels. So we have our ferroreductase reducing our ferric iron to ferrous iron, Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. We've got our divalent metal transporter taking that ferrous iron and hydrogen into the enterocytes. Once it's in, then what happens? Some, a lot of it gets oxidized back into Fe3 plus in the enterocytes, and then it can be stored as ferritin. So we have to absorb it as ferrous and store it as ferric. Um, but the, and so Fe3 is that storage. Fe2 plus is the form that can be moved through the body. So it's gonna be transported in circulation to places like the liver, the bone marrow, and it leaves the enterocytes using ferroportin. So this is one of the pieces that we, if you've been following Bob Miller's work, we've been talking about this for a long time. So ferroportin, is our um, iron exporter. So Tina, Fe2 plus is ferrous. Fe3 plus is ferric, which is the oxidized form. 
So we store ferric iron, that Fe3 plus as ferritin. We move and absorb the Fe2 plus, the ferrous form. So how does ferrous Fe2 plus get back out of the enterocytes? So this is the function of ferroportin. So that is what is encoded by that SLC40A1 that Bob Miller has been talking about for a few years. So we do know that variants on that SNP can potentially lead to significant increases in body stores of iron as long as it's getting into the enterocyte in the first place. I've talked to all of you a lot of times about looking for these compensatory patterns. And this is a place where there may potentially be a pattern where things work out better than they look like they might if, we, if all we do is look at a SNP uh, with not enough iron getting back out. But you may find compensatory mechanisms on the solute carriers for the divalent metal transporters preventing how much is getting in. Very similar to those patterns we see on the SLCOs and the ABCCs on the hepatocytes, slowing down what's getting in when not enough is getting out. So look for those compensatory mechanisms and cross-reference where you can with functional lab markers to see if it's a problem or not. And one of the big challenges is we can measure what's in serum and it's really hard to measure what's actually in tissue.